Hello everyone and welcome back to For All Humans. When it comes to pervasive misconceptions about Islam, there's no shortage of options to choose from. You know the ones I mean, the ones you hear on Fox News every now and then that goes something like this. By the year 2030, if Muslims continue to procreate at their current rate, which is to say like fast breeding rabbits, they will outnumber us all. So pack your bags and run for the hills. Or how about the panic driven cries of Sharia law is creeping into our courts? Well, there's another pervasive misconception about Islam and Muslims that has been rampant as of late, namely that an Islamic identity and a national identity are somehow incompatible. Today, we will be exploring this critical contemporary subject by looking at the intersecting relationship between Islam, Muslims, and the relatively modern concept of national identity. Islam is often portrayed as an all-encompassing, one-dimensional monolith, with media coverage of Muslim doctrine, communities, and opinions often positioning a Muslim identity as being diametrically opposed to a national identity. The notion that a Muslim religious identity is inherently a self-segregating one, which sits uncomfortably alongside a modern national identity, is widespread. But is it historically accurate? And more importantly, is it true of modern and long-standing Muslim communities living in the West? It's no secret that an increasing number of prominent public figures would have us believe that Islam, carried into Western countries by Muslims, is an existential threat that undermines the existence of Western and European culture, ethnicities, and identity. But this particular fallacy should be distinguished from other expressions of Islamophobia and racism for a number of reasons. Rather than simply expressing hatred or fear of the racialized other, those who say that an Islamic identity and a national identity are incompatible aim to position Islam specifically as a looming cultural, political, and ideological threat, allowing proponents to deny racial animosity as a driving motivation behind expression of this discourse. To understand this point better, we need to identify the often unspoken, underlying assumptions behind this discourse. And they are, simply put, that Muslims who identify as such are not viewed as any other religious communities such as Christians, Jews, Buddhists, etc. But rather, within this particular discourse, it seems the very act of identifying as Muslim precludes and excludes true affiliation and embrace of other identities, particularly that of a Western national identity. Therefore, the unspoken assumption is that, unlike British Jews or British Hindus, you can only really identify solely and exclusively as a Muslim who happens to be living in Britain. Within this discourse, attempting to identify as a British Muslim or a Western Muslim of any kind for that matter is to live a contradiction in terms with one identity directly threatening the other. Beyond the commonplace claims that Muslims were a physical threat in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, or that the religion of Islam breeds terrorists, the seeming irreconcilable differences between Muslim and national identity place ordinary Muslims as a threat to the civic body, simply by their existence within a non-Muslim population, rather than through their actions, real or imagined, in said terrorist plot. By positioning Muslim identity as incompatible with national identity, proponents are denying Western Muslim communities access to a shared civic identity and space, denying Muslim communities the ability to build spaces of mutual understanding and shared values. Now let's not for a moment fool ourselves into thinking that this is merely some kind of theoretical or abstract discourse and debate. The impact of the situation has had some very real and tangible consequences. Public debates have shifted from terror-based surveillance and monitoring issues to more nefarious policing and regulating expressions of Muslimness. Most alarmingly, Denmark has enacted a series of laws seemingly aimed at forcibly assimilating its Muslim population through a range of child indoctrination programs. Yes, you heard that correctly. Child indoctrination programs in a modern advanced European country in 2019. In Danish law, children specifically located within 25 low-income and overwhelmingly Muslim districts must be separated from their families for at least 25 hours per week. And this does not include nap time. The justification for this is that during these 25 hours, young children can be given mandatory instruction in Danish values. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that the narrative expressed thus far is striking. It suggests that there is something in Muslim identity that is at odds with national identity, and therefore a threat to our established national order and society. Muslims are a threat because their Muslim identity renders them inherently disloyal and alien, incapable of partaking in and enjoying the national identity that binds together other communities within the nation. 
So then what exactly does Islam have to say about this topic? When we turn to the key principles established in core Islamic texts, they deal with cultural distinctiveness and ethnic diversity in a clear and direct manner. An off-sided verse of the Quran exemplifies this sentiment. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair, a male and female, then made you into nations and tribes in order that you come to know one another. This recognition of the ethnic and cultural distinctiveness of human societies is one that is further developed and refined in the famous last sermon attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. There is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, nor for a non-Arab over an Arab. Neither is the white superior over the black, nor is the black superior over the white, except by piety. The above quote from the Quran gives clear refutation of any racial or ethnic hierarchy within Islam. Furthermore, we see references to ethnically and culturally diverse individuals in the early Muslim communities surrounding the Prophet Muhammad. For example, that of Bilal the Ethiopian, Salman the Persian, and Suhaib the Roman. Here, ethnic and cultural identifiers were used without any compromise of the identity of these individuals or of their identity as Muslims. What we can see here is an early and powerful indication that the emerging Muslim identity was not intended to erase other forms of cultural or ethnic identity, but rather these identities sat together harmoniously. And if you look back in the history books, you will find that even with the rapid spread of Islam and the emergence of successive Islamic empires, the original identities of the nations in question very much remain dominant, present and persistent. Notably, the Persian cultural and ethnic identity was never Arabized, remaining distinct and vibrant well into the modern era, and endures even in the current Islamic Republic. Other distinct ethnic and cultural identities also remained cohesive and effective. These include Berber, Kurdish, Assyrian, and Turkish identities, which coexisted with Muslim identity in the same regions that the Arab language and culture became widespread. The research shows that Muslims do appear to place considerably more importance on their religious identity than their non-Muslim counterparts. With a 1.8 billion Muslim population worldwide, the idea that this diverse group of communities could constitute a singular cultural or political grouping is evidently absurd, one that even a passing familiarity with the history or current affairs of these regions would attest to. If the perspective that Muslim identity is incompatible with national identities requires a coherent and cohesive Muslim identity, then it is an argument that requires little effort to rebut. Moving to a modern setting, these underlying trends of multiple identities are ever more visible. The ethnic, cultural, and geographic diversity of the Muslim world is extremely broad and a far cry from being dominated by Arab-speaking countries. Drawing from the Pew Research Center, one third of all Muslims today hail from the Indian subcontinent, with a further 15% located in sub-Saharan Africa, 13% in Indonesia alone, and 8% residing in Europe. While the Middle East and North Africa region hosts 23% of the world's Muslims, this also includes large Persian populations as well as smaller Berber, Turkish, and other ethnic groups. Only an estimated 20% of Muslims worldwide speak Arabic natively, and slightly fewer identify as culturally Arab. So whether she's a hockey-loving Canadian Muslim or a baguette-bunching Parisian Muslim, you can bet your Muslim neighbor is just as proud of their beautiful country, whichever and wherever it may be. If you liked what you saw, please remember to like, comment, share, and let us know what you think in the comment section below. See you all next time.